Um, we are, this is Dr. Greg Wigington. He is a psychiatry resident through the program that's a shared program through UNMC in Creighton in Omaha. And he's been out here twice. I, some of you probably, I think we're at his delirium, our dementia presentation um, back in July. And it, it was very good then. And I think this is going to be a good presentation on ADHD. And I think this is something um, all people of, people of all ages can struggle with, but um, you probably have somebody that may be close enough to you that's affected by it. So hopefully get a little information and I'll let him take it from here. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm a second year resident in the psychiatry program at Creighton and UMC. So they have a joint program. There's about, uh, my class is eight residents. Uh, this year's class is nine. We're continuing to grow. So it's a pretty good medium-sized program throughout the country. Uh, my background, I'm from Skyler, Nebraska originally. Uh, went to UNL, I did a degree in engineering. Then I went to work for Creighton, did clinical research for about four years for diabetes, and then went to medical school finally. And so, uh, went to UNMC and then decided to stay. I, uh, I definitely like it, Nebraska, and I'm going to stay in Nebraska. And, uh, if I'll stay in Omaha, that's yet to be decided, so we'll see. Um, but basically the topic today is ADHD. So there's ADD, hyperactivity, slash behavioral problems. A lot of people you know, will come in and talk about this. So, Going to go over an overview of ADHD, the epidemiology, signs and symptoms that you'll see with ADHD, some of the diagnosing criteria, prognosis of these individuals when you um, uh, when they are diagnosed, um, kind of how you diagnose them, as well as the treatment protocol uh, for these patients. So this is just a brief uh, YouTube video. I've seen that, Carrie. Mm -hmm. Can you see? Yeah. Or do you need me to move Okay. Hello, I'm Dr. Gerald Chodak. Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADHD, is a term many of us have probably heard before. But what does it actually mean? Simply put, ADHD is a common behavioral disorder that emerges in children before the age of seven. It can extend into adolescence and even adulthood. ADHD was first identified as a disorder in 1902, and for years doctors believed it was the result of serious brain damage. While that theory has since been proven wrong, the precise causes of ADHD are still unknown. What we do know is that the occurrence of ADHD is closely tied biological factors such as the size and density of various brain structures and the way chemical reactions take place within the brain. For example, scientists have discovered that children with ADHD often have a smaller cortex, the part of the brain that controls thought and action. This diminished size usually occurs in the area of the cortex known as the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe is an especially important part of the brain playing a role in many key functions, including impulse control, socialization, reason, and judgment. Experts believe this may help explain why some children with ADHD are more prone to drifting off, making sudden outbursts, or using poor judgment. Other research into ADHD has focused on nerve tissue in different areas of the brain. It appears that in children with ADHD, this nerve tissue is smaller, or sometimes thinner, than in normal children of the same age. While scientists aren't yet certain as to why, they believe these variations can affect a child's attention and impulse control. In addition to the physical differences in brain structure, many experts believe that people with ADHD, like those with depression, have chemical differences as well. Some studies have shown that children with ADHD 
have lower amounts of the neurotransmitter dopamine in the brain. Neurotransmitters are chemical messengers that carry information to and from nerve cells. Since dopamine plays a key role in the proper function of the cortex, not having enough of it could interfere with cognitive processes, such as focusing and attention, the very same processes that people with ADHD struggle with. And though it's still being tested, the so-called dopamine theory seems to be supported by the fact that stimulants, which are often used to treat ADHD symptoms, work by increasing dopamine levels. Scientists still don't know the exact causes of ADHD, but much progress has been made. The more they discover about the roots of the disorder, the better equipped they'll be to develop more effective methods for understanding, diagnosing, and treating this common ailment. So that's one of, the, one of the footages that I have, so you don't have to listen to me talk this whole time. Um, but as well as, um, so some of the epidemiology. So it's roughly estimated that it affects approximately 3 to 7%. Uh, they say 4% of adults. This consensus is a roughly 10%, they say, is what they, they, they assume. So boys usually more than girls. Um, so it can be anywhere from two to nine, I think they're right in the middle, around four to one, <coughs> usually. So there's a genetic component as well, as seen with twin studies. Um, High-risk populations, people have first-degree relatives with ADHD. Uh, people have siblings with ADHD are two times likely to have it compared to the regular population and parents um, of children as well are at high risk of having ADHD. So some predisposing factors, the temperament of the child, the genetic components, and then societal demands as well of children these days. Um, usually present by the age of three, you can start noticing these things. Um, so, do parents uh, more likely to have alcohol use disorders or antisocial personality as well than the general population? And apparently, September is the peak month for birth for ADHD kids as well. <coughs> so, a lot of That's the ADHD enough. patients or children have uh, aggression oh, and defiance consistently as well. And then, um, Children whose mothers have smoked during pregnancy are twice as likely to develop ADHD. So these are some of the outcomes of ADHD patients outside school. So they're much more to have this impulse control problem, uh, making poor judgments, as you can kind of see in some of these things on this slide, compared to the general population, um, especially drugs, alcohol, you know, not following rules is very difficult for them as well. So I thought this was kind of an interesting slide. So that's for some of the criteria. Uh, basically, there's they use two sets of criteria: one for the inattention aspects of ADHD, and also one for the hyperactivity and facility points. And so basically, there's nine for each, and you have to have at least six out of nine of each one. So basically, you know, the inattentive portion is, this is usually girls that have this type of um, ADHD. Usually they don't, they don't pay attention to details very well, um, have difficulty uh, with tasks, uh, don't really listen to you when being spoken to, they kind of zone you out. Um, you know, it's really hard for them to follow through on things, they're kind of the kids that They'll get one or two steps, and then it just kind of goes to disaster. Um, doesn't really like to do things that require effort as well. You know, if it's something easy, it's no problem, but when it takes actual mental effort to do things, that's when it becomes difficult for them. Um, loses things quite often, easily distracted, and then just forgetful as well. So as in the other type, the hyperactivity and impulsivity, so these are the kids that you see that are just, they just 
feel like they have so much energy. They're constantly being run by a motor, is what some people describe them as. Can't really sit still for periods of time. Um, you know, get up from their chair when they're not supposed to. Uh, goes and runs around, climbs on things. Uh, you know, there's kind of that kid that you kind of wonder what's going on. You need to deal with that. Um, you know, they can't do anything really quiet. It's always kind of elevated volume as well. Uh, you know, they uh, blurt out answers even before maybe they even get the question out, like such as teachers. Uh, troubles waiting turns and kind of intrusive as well, or interrupts with people. So these things, all, like the video said, has to be present before the age of seven. Uh, we kind of see there's, you know, an adult ADHD. Some people have, you know, you can see some of these before seven, but some people have good coping mechanisms as well. So they don't, you know, either they have maybe a higher IQ or they come with coping mechanisms that they can kind of get around this. So they may not be, it might not be a problem at age seven, but maybe it will be later on in their life. Um, so it has to be two or more settings. So it's, let's say at school and at home or some other setting. It just can't be just at home as well. Um, you know, so significant impairment. You know, are Johnny's grades getting worse? Is he constantly going to the principal's office? It's you know, these other issues um, as well. So these other things, you can't have a pervasive developmental disorder like um, autism or some other types of disorder, schizophrenia or psychotic disorder. Um, you know, it can't be accounted for by, say, depression, anxiety, other mood disorders or personality disorder as well. So basically there's three types. So there's the combined type, which is an inattentiveness as well as the uh, hyperactive impulsive type. So they have at least six of each. Uh, those two scales that I talked about earlier. And so they have to be at least for six months, they have to be present as well. And this is the most common type as well. So the inattentive type, then it's just those six out of nine for the attentive symptoms. Um, and that's usually, like I said earlier, girls, whereas the dominantly the hyperactive impulsive boys as well. So those are really the three types that you can, you can really, so ADHD combined type is how you diagnose um, a child or whatever symptoms they meet criteria. So have a, you know, this is the usual and looking out windows, looking at what's going on rather than maybe paying attention. I do have a video talking about executive function uh, with these individuals. And they talk about frontal lobe issues, that they have a little bit different networking neurally than other individuals. The latest thinking on ADHD includes the topic of executive function as being related to ADHD and possibly actually being the core functions or deficits in the disorder. Now, we can think of the executive function simply as those capacities for self-control that allow us to sustain action and problem solving toward a goal. So it's goal-directed problem solving and goal-directed persistence. Now, there are at least five of these executive functions that appear to be involved in self-regulation. And research suggests that most of them, and probably all of them, are implicated in the disorder. The first of these is the ability to inhibit your behavior, to stop what you're doing, in order to allow the other executive functions to be able to take over and guide your behavior toward the future. The second is the ability to use visual imagery, often called nonverbal working memory. Humans have the ability to hold images in mind about what they are proposing to do and they use those images as mental maps to guide their behavior toward the intended target, and also to remember the sequence of steps that's necessary to accomplish that goal or that task. Out of this executive ability also comes our sense of hindsight, foresight, and overall our subjective sense of time. So we would expect all of these to be impaired by the disorder. 
and so they seem to be. The third executive ability is the ability to talk to yourself in your mind as a form of self-guidance. From sunup to sundown, all of our waking moments include a voice in our head that we use not just to converse with ourselves, but also to give ourselves instructions and even to question ourselves when we face a novel situation or a problem. This mind's voice is often called verbal working memory, and it's another form of self-control that humans use to guide behavior over time to accomplish goals. Now, the fourth executive ability is the ability to control our own emotions, and with it, our motivations. It is out of here that we get emotional self-control, the ability to inhibit strong emotion that's being elicited by things around us, and to moderate those emotions so that they're more in keeping with our long-term welfare and our long-term goals. And then finally, there is the ability to plan and problem-solve. This executive function involves mental play, the ability to manipulate information in mind in order to discover novel combinations that might serve to overcome obstacles toward our goals and allow us to accomplish our tasks and goals as we aim our behavior toward the future. These five executive functions by adulthood serve as a set of mind tools, a veritable Swiss army knife of mental faculties that allow people to regulate their own behavior over time for their own long-term wealth. Some of the ways that we can go about screening people for ADHD. So there's child screening forms. So Vanderbilt is one screening form I think that's very classical that people use. There's Connors, the ADHD rating scale four. Uh, basically, you can pretty much find quite a bit of information on the internet as well. The adult ADHD self-reported scale. Uh, you know, this is. You know, some people don't believe in an adult ADHD. So it all depends on providers and things like that because anymore you can find a lot of information about ADHD, find out the symptoms. If you really want a stimulant, you can probably fill this out and look like you have ADHD. So there's kind of there's issues, you know, with adult ADHD as well. And so this is a uh, they call this. I'm going to show you a video about physical drop is what they it's a mnemonic for diagnosing adult ADHD as well. And this will be the last video I have. And so I thought this was kind of interesting. Medical Minute. News you can use in your clinical practice. <coughs> well, I'm Dr. David Michael, Department of Psychiatry, this is San Diego Medical Center. <coughs> Research indicates that around 4.5% of adult population in the United States meets the criteria for ADHD yet it remains severely under-recognized. Recognizing ADHD in adults remains a tricky prospect for many physicians. In medicine, the modern play an important role in helping physicians learn to easily recall the signs and symptoms of a disease or a disorder so they can efficiently screen for it. Today, however, there's no easy mnemonic to help screen adults with ADHD. That is why my colleagues and I at UC San Diego Medical Center have developed a mnemonic in school of If you remember, this in the mind by recalling the fact that compared to others, adults with ADHD experience a physical drop, alluding to the research that shows that adults with ADHD have lower impacts. Each of the letters of physical drop is a question prompt for one of the more common independent or impulsive features that ADHD adults experience. And each letter corresponds directly to one or more of the items in the DSM-4 the brief and efficient, physical drop does not screen for hyperactive symptoms, since these are quite rare in adults and virtually never present in the absence of inattentive or impulsive features. Furthermore, physical drop uses phrases that are more colloquial and more geared to the adult with ADHD than the formal wording in the DSM. For example, the first letter, F, stands for finisher, and it would prompt you to ask a patient, are you a good finisher of tasks and projects that you start? This corresponds to the DSM, DSM item often does not follow through on instructions and 
fails to finish schoolwork, chores, or duties in the workplace, which I'm sure you'll agree is neither geared for the adult nor uses language that you would use with your patients. Let's go through the rest of the mnemonic. I stands for impatient. You could ask, would you consider yourself a patient person? S stands for sidetracked. You would ask a patient, is getting sidetracked when you sit out to accomplish something a big problem in your life? C stands for careless. Are you more likely than most people you know to make careless mistakes? A stands for absent-minded. Would you say you are very absent-minded, or have others often commented that you are absent-minded? L stands for listener. Do others frequently complain that you are not a good listener? D stands for distracted. When you are in a situation where you need to concentrate, are you more easily distracted by things around you than other people? R stands for reader. Are you an efficient reader? O stands for organized. How good of an organizer are you compared to other people? You know? P stands for procrastinator. You might ask, would you say you're a major procrastinator when it comes to doing things that need a lot of sustained focus? Now, if a patient answers affirmative to any of the questions, I suggest ask them to generate examples of this feature. People with true ADHD can easily provide numerous convincing anecdotes illustrating each of the items that they endorse. Finally, please do remember that the fiscal drop should not be used as a diagnostic tool, but rather only as a screening tool. There you have it, fiscal drop, an mnemonic to help you screen for ADHD in adults. Thank you. such as conduct disorder, opposition to defiant disorder, as well as anxiety and depression. Uh, so, you know, there's might be, there might be something else going on rather than what you think, particularly ADHD. And this is kind of what it looks like as well. And there's one version for teachers and there's one version for adults. And this is usually, you know, the very first step. Uh, if you think your child has ADHD, you know, physicians should get this from both sources just so to see if they match the big issue. So some of the differential diagnosis, you know, temperamental personality, having high activity, short attention span, but within normal range. You know, it's, um, I think that's the key. You know, is it, is it significantly impairing this child's ability to go through school, socially, or other aspects of their life? You know, or is it just, you know, it's, it's really not that bad. Just, just maybe bad compared to other children in the family as well. So depression. Um, you know, a lot of these students they feel, um, you know, like academics is not for them. It's very difficult for them. They've always had a difficult um, concept going through school. Low self-esteem that usually results. Uh, the other thing is anxiety. Um, you know, that can be distracting. Somebody can't, they're always on edge, always very nervous, um, you know, then they can't remember, because that, that's the other thing, they become forgetful as well. Uh, mania, patients that have bipolar disorder, because they share many of the same features, uh, like pressured speech, so they talk faster, they're very hyperactive, get a lot of things done, or think that, at least they think that they do very distractible, very irritable as well, especially in children. That's a big issue is the irritability. Conduct disorder, you know, so these are the children, um, you see this that, you know, are aggressive towards animals or more people. Uh, they don't follow rules um, as well as um, have other issues with destruction of property, you know, vandalism, that type of stuff. And this is kind of the precursor to antisocial behavior as well. Um, <clears throat> a lot of times kids with ADHD also have learning disorders as well. Um, you know, at least one, uh, whether it's reading, math, or even written expression type of learning disorders. And then some of the other things to look at is vision hearing problems, as well as thyroid or seizure disorders as well. 
So a lot of these cases will progress into adulthood, and that's about what you talked about, about four and a half to five percent range as well. Some cases it will remit. Um, you know, in others, like you talked about, the hyperactivity will, will almost resolve completely, but it's the other issues, the impulsiveness and the attention span that lingers um, as well. So some of the issues are his family history, negative life events, um, comorbidity, comorbidities as well, um, depression and anxiety. So these are kind of all things that weigh in on ADHD as well. Um, usually won't go in for 12 years of age. Um, a lot of these patients, when they become adults, they're accident prone as well. Um, and like he talked about, educational attainment is lower with uh, people who have ADHD as well. Um, early on, employment histories don't differ, but then later on in life they do. So, um, and then adolescents are at risk for developing conduct disorder as well. So there's a lot of risks. Um, you know, this isn't treated. Especially for developing sub substance related disorders. Because a lot of times they will try different things to slow down or to feel different, or you know, they're not sure why that they're feeling that way. So, social dysfunction, um, you know, that's a big issue, um, especially with like hyperactivity, um, you know, being intrusive. They still, it's harder for them to make friends, keep friends be accepted uh, because of their behavior. Um, you know, I think the, the goal is those to improve the social functioning of these individuals to reduce their aggressiveness and to improve their family situation. That's really what's going to be optimal for these individuals. So, this is just kind of the way people are with ADHD sometimes. <laughs> So a lot of times it's treatment. So stimulants are usually first line. There's also non-stimulant medications, uh, psychoeducation, community support, and behavioral interventions that can be tried. Um, there has been research that has shown that a multimodal aspect of using all of these together is the best treatment for individuals with ADHD. Not specifically just stimulants or education or, or whatnot. And I know a lot of people talk about diet in ADHD, but there hasn't been any evidence shown that uh, diet is significant as well. So, a lot of these, so you can use them in children three years of age, dextroamphetamines, or the methylphenidates in uh, children greater than six years of age as well. The non-stimulants, these are kind of all the stimulants that are currently out on the market as well. I know that doesn't mean a whole lot. We'll, we'll go through this graph. So kind of usually first line for patients that, uh, that I see. I don't see a whole lot of children, but I see adults um, or roughly right in between. Um, so Ritalin is usually a good way to start because it has the least amount of side effects. And you kind of move to, you know, that's methylphenidates. A lot of these you've probably heard of, you know, Concertas, the long-acting, basically form of Ritalin. Um, they go to the next methylphenidates, Focalin as well, um, Adderall, and they have to combine as well. There's a new one, I think Vyvanse is the very last one as well. And so, you know, the, the idea is, is once a day dosing because these individuals have a problem keeping on task. So if you can just get them to take it once in the morning, have it long acting, um, you know, that really helps usually. Instead of having to take it two or three times a day, you know, having to go to the nurse and do that, um, and then people know, and, you know, it's, it's an issue, especially in schools. So, so this is one of the most one of our best treatments in psychiatry as well as with PCT, Dr. 
business, obviously. Um, they say 70% of children will respond positively. Um, you know, if you switch the drug, another 20% will respond as well. Um, usually, if your first and second drugs don't work, it's probably something else is what they usually. So you kind of go back, check the diagnosis, see what, you know, maybe I just didn't get enough of the history or I didn't talk to the right people for collateral information as well. So that's kind of, you know, and maybe you do have it right, maybe it's just not working, but I think it's worth a look to go back and check that. So in these cases, you know, no stimulants. Uh, glaucoma, people who have anxiety, agitation, nervousness, because it will make them even more nervous. I mean, they will be really on edge. Um, when they take the MAOIs, the monoamine and oxidase inhibitors for depression, which aren't really, you don't really see that much anymore, but there's still a few people out there on them, but they cannot be on them as well. People who have motor tics or Tourette's syndrome should not be um, given a stimulant, or if they even have a family history, it may even bring out that tic disorder. Um, you're not really sure if it's the dopamine, <coughs> the dopamine uh, because it gets uh, secreted, and that's why they'll start doing all these tics and everything. And psychotic disorders because it'll make psychosis even worse on these individuals. And, uh, probably have something that's out of control. So, you know, the side effects decreased appetite, insomnia, headache. You know, a lot of these are stimulants, so it'll keep people up, it'll keep their appetite suppressed. Um, headache, not really sure if it's what the reasoning is, but you'll get rebound. So you just Patients that are more irritable, they'll even be even more hyperactive if you do not take the medication as scheduled as well, and they'll become even more irritable because of the other issue. <coughs> so some of the, I guess, strategies for side effects um, in these individuals is changing the dosages. It might be one way, adjusting the schedule. A lot of times they talk about right after breakfast, right after lunch, because of the appetite suppression. So you don't want these uh, children to get, um, they're dropping off the growth charts because they're not eating as well. Um, you know, the other thing might be is uh, maybe seven o'clock in the morning or nine o'clock in the morning, depending on how, how well uh, it works for them. So it's really a flexible schedule as well. And using the different medications, I know a lot of times when you first start dosing an individual with, uh, you want to use the short acting, because you're not quite sure how they're going to be affected by giving them a stimulant. So I'm going to give them a short acting one so it doesn't last all day if you have an adverse outcome, or if it makes them worse, or something happens that you know, maybe they're even allergic to it. Um, usually they say talking about doing it on the weekends, you know, rather than doing it during school, or doing it over the summer, as well, um, I talk, you know, they talk about that to see how well this, how well it works. And a lot of times, that the side effects will usually resolve after a few weeks. So they talk about having a physical exam, at baseline, blood pressure, and pulse, weight, and height. Because there are studies saying that um, you know you're concerned about blood pressure because it can cause that to go up in the individuals. <coughs> um, you know their weight because of decreased appetite, height. That's one thing that it doesn't affect height. Initially it will, a lot of times, but they will catch up later in life. It's kind of a stunted, but it doesn't significantly affect them compared to control subjects that they've found um, as well. So that's kind of why a lot of times we just like to get blood pressure, pulse, height, and weight, and then just annually a physical exam as well. So some medical issues, yeah, this is they were really worried about this stunting people's growth um, as well. And really, that's they just usually catch up later in life, especially if they continue on the medication as well. And then there's been lately cardiac risks as well. Of should we get EKGs on these individuals before we start medications? Um, you know, they basically say it's a physician's judgment. If there's you know, 
history of congenital anomalies for heart defects or some type of family history or something that you're worried about, um, you know, it might be a good idea. But it's definitely not mandatory, and I don't think you'd be scrutinized to or something. But I think it's just the idea that you know that should be in the back of your mind when you're prescribing stimulants to anybody, you know, to make sure. But uh, that's been one thing that they've been talking about in the, in the news. So second line treatments, so like Stratera is one of them, Wellbutrin, um, um, Effexor. Clonidine, I guess guanfacine or 10x. Um, I've talked about that this morning. But these are some of the other ways that, so if you don't want your child to be on a stimulant and you just don't want to deal with that because you have to get a script every month, go to the pharmacy, you can't be called in, you know, all those things. Um, this is another way. Or, you know, so maybe, maybe you want to start this way first rather than using stimulants. That's another good way. Um, you know, they're probably not quite as efficient or you know, efficacious as the stimulants, but I think they're worth a shot. You know, I think it's, it's it really depends on what families want to do with their children. Um, I think that's the big thing as well. You know, and there might be some depression, so you may want to do an antidepressant as well. I mean, there's, I think there's a lot of things if you just discuss this uh, with families that, you know, maybe some families don't believe in who knows? You just never, you're not quite sure. So then you maybe you want to do a, like a blood pressure medication like Lonidine or Lonfacine. So I guess other treatments. So a lot of, a lot of education with families. You know, the, the child's not doing this on purpose. This is not, <laughs> you know, there's nothing, um, you know, the child's just not a bad child. They're not doing this spite you, <laughs> you know, that these are things that can be fixed, that they can be, you know, we can try to make things better uh, as well. I think educating schools as well, I think that's another thing. Um, I think they're doing a much better job of that as well. And working with the schools so that they can make an individual <coughs> education plan, those IEPs that they talk about for your child so that you guys are all on the same page and that nobody's getting just moved on and moved on without necessarily getting what they need out of what they're offered. So those individual education plans, anybody can ask for or request that to be done for their child. Um, and that is always something that you sure can ask if you're concerned about it. Yeah, and that's a great thing to do. Those IEPs, yes, have <coughs> really changed the way schools deal with um, kids that struggle. And it's not just kids with ADHD, that's mm -hmm. any kid with any kind of problem or difficulty, um, it's having a hard time, you know, they'll do an assessment to see what percentage of time your child is staying on task. They'll give you a number of what percent of time. They basically watch that child for 24 hours or 48 hours and they give you a time that says they stayed on task this much time, they were fidgeting with their pencil this amount of time or you know, looking out the window or whatever and then you can develop some plans or strategies that hopefully can help redirect and keep your child on task. And it, it, like I said, it may not have to be ADHD for that to happen, so mm -hmm. that's something to keep in mind. Right, exactly. And I think that's the other thing, is schools are, are just, you know, I, I talked to a patient the other day, and they're like, this wasn't even something that we could do when I was in school. No you know, this was not an option. This was, right. you're gonna sit there, and you're gonna learn, and you're gonna be quiet. And I think things are changing. Um, it, it really depends on the school districts. Like in Omaha, it depends on which school you're at. It depends on, you know, just a lot of factors. You know, depending on how many kids they have, how many things are going on. So, you know, I think the community support is also you know, support groups for families. I was re I was reading this thing the other day about how, um, like, parents that have children that have ADHD will like get together because the kids know that their behaviors are the way they are and that they accept them. And so if they get mad at the other one or they hit them or they do something, it's just kind of like, okay, well, that happens. That's part of what I deal with every day and they kind of work it out themselves. And so it's not a big issue. And so that they can be kind of a more of a normal setting. I don't know. Um, 
they talk about blogging, chat rooms, discussions, you know, just the idea of being able to vent to other people, people that know what they're going through, I think is a huge thing as well. Uh, they'll talk about behavioral interventions, so counseling, uh, to help the children with their frustrations, to help build their self-esteem so that they don't become depressed or feel um, you know, neglected in school because they're not, you know, they can't do well on a test or something like that. Um, you know, having parents with supportive strategies for children, uh, getting them like a routine. They come home, this is what time we do this, this is what time we do that, we go and do this, this and this and this, and, this, and it's, everything's planned out. <coughs> you know, social skills training, taking turns, sharing, being, you know, doing things, you know, not interrupting. Um, you know, just, and I think it's the things that kids are that they're impulsive about. They don't think about it until it's too late. So I think getting it before it happens, you know, more preventative type of things. Um, you know, and then the, the clear routines by parents. So I think there's a lot of ways behaviorally that we can work with these, not just with medications. And then school interventions, special education maybe, you know, smaller classrooms, maybe that these uh, kids will do better in, maybe the, the classrooms are quieter, maybe they give them longer times to do their tests. Um, you know, I knew just in medical school that happened for people, you know, if they had issues, or in college classes that happens, you know, people need more time because they can't process the information exactly like you know, somebody else. Um, you know, modification techniques of redirecting, putting kids right next to the teacher that, you know, may be closer so that they can keep an eye on them a little bit better, putting them next to students that are good role models, that are quiet, that are good students, um, that helps as well. Um, you know, keeping them away from windows, keeping them away from hallways, you know, just different things that, you know, I think teachers probably have already been doing those things, it just wasn't, you know, I think so. And then just academic interventions of maybe having different study materials for them in a way, or really instead of having just like a page of writing, you just do bullets for these individuals so they don't become overwhelmed as well. So I guess this is really the big hope take home message is, you know, to get these kids so that they can succeed. So that's really the issue getting them before they're depressed, before they start you know, getting into bad habits, bad judgments, um, doing things that you know, we don't want our kids to be doing as well. So, I don't know if anybody had questions or anything like that. It was kind of long. But. I also would say ADHD doesn't mean your, your child is a bad student um, either. It, we, you can have some of the top students that have ADHD, they just often don't get diagnosed as early because they don't get in trouble. And, and if your kid doesn't get in trouble, people just often, they don't necessarily address it. Like if the kid is getting in trouble, if your child is getting in trouble, then they want something done about it. But if your child is a good student and moving, you know, even though they're having problems focusing, maybe making school harder and I mm -hmm. you know you mentioned it's frustrating for the child it's frustrating for you and so <laughs> the more help you can get them um, yeah. because it's usually the kids that aren't the ones that aren't getting in trouble and, right yeah. they're the ones that get diagnosed much later and mm -hmm. and you get them on medicine and you'd, you'd be amazed at what their grades can do yeah. or they'll start out having good grades and then it just gets each year you go it just gets a little bit harder and harder and you're just thinking oh the material's getting harder and you just kind of put it off and thinking okay we just need to buckle down and um and then you get them on something and then the next thing you know they're back to getting good grades and it's just that much harder for them to focus and, um, and most kids when you ask them you know do you have a hard time paying attention they know they have time paying attention, they know they can't keep focused on what they're supposed to be doing, and so it's tough. Yeah, it is a, it's a very tough thing, because then, you know, you, it's behavior, is it behavioral, is it, you know, what's going on exactly with, you know, these individuals, you're not quite sure, um, you know, and that's why you have to get a lot of collateral information from the parents 
from the teachers, from them themselves. And it's something that's been going on six months. That's also important too because, you know, kids can have a stressor that sets them off mm -hmm. that is completely affecting how their school is going mm -hmm. for the first six months, you know, whatever it is, whether there's been a death in the family. And you may not think it affected them that much and it that may be the way they're showing it. Mm -hmm. You know, and, the, and the really the first line treatment are, uh, you know, primary care providers, you know, pediatricians, family practice, and because the wait for a child's psych is three to six months, if not longer, and so, you know, my thing is, is uh, you know, let's try them on something, you know, try something, because if they're not doing well right now, nothing's going to change in six months usually. You know, if it's already been ongoing for that long. Might as well try and implement something before you can kind of see that psychiatrist or see something who specializes in it. Yeah, you know, because it's I think it's definitely worth worth doing that rather than failing a grade or demoralizing you know, the student, his child. You know that they just don't get it and they're never going to be good. What do you do for like a college student um, who can't? Go on the medications because he wants to be a helicopter pilot. And a hel you know, if you're <coughs> medicated, then you will not get a pilot's license. Right. So, I mean, where would I go for resources for him? I mean, because yeah. so, I mean, it's even they don't even want that in the medical record for a pilot's license, you know. And so I'm kind of that's why I'm here. <laughs> you know, I'm kind of at a loss of where to how to get him help, but not ruin his career dreams. Right, right. You know, I would definitely see, um, yeah, because that's a tough situation. It's a very <laughs> tough situation. Uh, In all honesty, you're probably, you, I mean, to not be on medicine, you're looking at really having some behavioral interventions and finding ways. That's how I'm starting it, is the behavior. It really needs to be some behavioral interventions and setting up some things, you know, if it's, it's, if it's in college that you're having a hard time setting, you know, sitting for tests or things like that, you know, we need to be talking to the instructors, instructors and explain that this is what I'm doing, um, you know, set, okay, I've got to sit and do, trying to build yourself into being able to sit for a longer period of time to get through tests and things like that, or, you know, setting some goals as to okay. what type of just some short-term goals of things that you want to meet as far as things that you can accomplish in that in your academic semester you know what do I want to do as far as this particular subject you know what do I need how do I how can I improve things how can you um, you know a lot of times on campuses they have tutors and that would be a good place to go um, doing that the tu tutoring center sure. often do they yeah. have different they often can talk to instructors if you're having problems you know that there's ways that you know again that's where taking getting longer test time or you know testing at a certain time of day you know some kids can do much better first thing in the morning and then as the day goes on we just digress or later in the day and so those are types of things that may be able to help them but a lot of times a, a tutoring service um, has some assistance for those type of people so okay be a place to start. So what kind of symptoms does he kind of have, just, just out of curiosity? Um, not so much the hyperactivity. He's 21, and so, it, you know, I don't think the hyperactivity is so much there, but... It's just the focus? He, he cannot focus. <laughs> you know, you you give him a, you know, go to the grocery store and get three items, and he'll come back with one. You know, it's just... And then with college, he couldn't... He says when the instructor was talking, he would just completely space off. And he, you know, he says, I can't concentrate on what the instructor says, and he tries, and, and he, he failed out of college, and so we're kind of doing like a last oh, ditch. Yeah. So is he taping everything when he goes to classes? Not yet, but that's what I'm finding he needs to do, and so he's not in it net, you know. And that's what tutoring services would probably yep. go through. We did the tutoring. Before. But but like if you ask the, like a lot of times your director of your tutoring services, um, can give you some of those study aids like that. Oh, okay. yes, recording, you know, so. recording your lectures, um, better ways for note taking so that you can get the information that's important and you're not taking all the extra stuff on, that type of thing. Yeah. Okay. Studying every night, doing things yeah. on time. Yeah. 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 Breaking things down. 
That's yeah. That's what we're talking about. Fifteen-year intervals for studying. We sometimes. we have kids. I mean, in medical school, that would take a stimulant on the day of the test. That's you know because that way they know. I mean, you have to sit and take an eight-hour test. Um, you, you need some focus. You need to be able to sit there. And, and so you know they wouldn't necessarily take it otherwise. But that's the thing about stimulants is they work that day and that time. So when you take it, it's there and it's functioning. So I have a junior high student, and I'm not sure if it's new this year, but all of his core classes are in the morning with that in mind of kids are fresh in the morning. Would it help to take a stimulant just for those first four hours, or do you have to stay on it throughout the day so it's in your system? Well, you could do just the short acting. So you could take it in the morning. You could take a short acting, and it's going to last him for about four to six hours. It's in the morning. It's yep. PE and music, I don't care. Right. I have a question. Mm -hmm. if, <clears throat> Excuse me, if you choose not to use medications for an elementary school, elementary school student and you use the other, the other strategies, do you have any, any criteria on the outcomes? I don't. Um, what is the likelihood of success without right. the medication? No, that's a really that's tough, out there. yeah, that's <laughs> not a whole lot of information they do a lot of <clears throat> a lot of the research is medication versus that versus both together usually and the significance is both is usually getting that with the medication unfortunately I, I, I really couldn't tell you because if my child isn't going to outgrow it I'd rather have him learn those skills <coughs> early on rather than being medicated and have him go mm -hmm. through the motions and not have those skills when he needs them right. in high school at all Mm -hmm. But also understand that giving him the opportunity to be able to focus and learn, you know, is now. <laughs> and, and hope he will still. There is, you know, they still will often grow out of it. But, um, you know, if he's having a hard time focusing, it's hard to be able to um, make school as meaningful to be able to, you know, to be able to get what you want out of school. And then outgrowing by puberty, is that a hormone rush? Is that what we're... Probably, you know, the, the thought process with the dopamine being a potential etiology. So yes, it's probably shifting hormones, that's potentially. But I tell you, most kids that have it in elementary school, we're still treating it. Mm -hmm. Most kids are still going to be on something into junior high and into high school. Are you seeing stuff in college? Are they not are very they often? They need it then? Not very often. I definitely have some college kids that um, will take it during the week while they're on, yep, while they're in classes. They'll take it the five days a week in classes, um, but not a lot. It's, a, it's, it's actually a new college thing to be on it is. stimulants. Because it is. It's a bad anybody on a stimulant, it is going to increase your performance usually, right. no matter what. So is it addictive? Usually with kids, it can be. It, with kids, it's not supposed to be, but right. with adults, that's the problem. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. and that's it's abuse potential. It's a it's a scheduled drug. It's a controlled substance, and that's why that is. Yeah. They say usually kids with ADHD or adults do not usually abuse it yeah. because they use it exactly what it's supposed to be for. Because they see the benefit of the mm -hmm. medicine. Yeah, so that's usually not an abusive potential with them. It's usually people who use it for other reasons. Yeah. yeah, it's not just True. those things. <laughs> right. right. I know with the ADH that I've seen in kids, it it doesn't just affect their schoolwork, it affects making friends, it affects the family, it affects everybody. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. so if you can, you know, my you know my thought is, is you're not just treating the kid or the patient, you're treating really everybody around them as well. Yes. Many different ways. That makes the child's life so much better to me. More meaningful. Everybody's life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, I mean. But granted, I think it's overdiagnosed mm -hmm. as right. well. So, you know, people want, you know, we get lots of kids that come home yeah. from school and they're like, the teachers want them on something mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, the parents don't feel like it's necessary. Um, so, there is a line and, right. and it's hard to know what. So it really does, you know, some of that looking into, okay, 
what are some of the issues? I always have, I use Connors, I actually don't use Vanderbilt, I use the Connors scale, and one's still filled out by parents and one's filled out by teachers, but um, it, to me, that's my way of, uh, of being able to determine, okay, are these both in both, in both home and school? And then I have them fill it out again in three months after they've been on the medicine to see where we're at, and usually they'll do it. Does it, does it always start in, in um, young children, or can it start like all of a sudden when they're 15 or 16, or? Not, it, it's, that's one of the things is that it tends to start at a young age. I don't think it usually pops up in somebody. Then I would encourage them to look at other comorbidities, other things that potentially may be causing that, anxiety, depression, um, something like that that's probably driving those symptoms more than actual ADHD. You can, you can get by, but you have to have good coping mechanisms. And that's, and that's probably it. You know, they, they, you probably, if they are not getting diagnosed until they're 15 or 16, they have just been such a good student. Well, they found somebody to do their homework for them. Or, <laughs> I mean, in general. That's what we found right. out. <laughs> but then as they get old enough that the intensity level, or they go to college, and the yes. intensity level of the volume of work and um, reading and stuff has increased so much that then it really becomes an issue. And that's where that's where those good students, those really good straight A students are the ones that you're gonna diagnose later in life because they've breezed through up to this point because they always get good grades and they're not getting in trouble. They have a hard time focusing or concentrating, but it hasn't necessarily caused them a decline in their schoolwork and function. And so, those are the ones that usually get diagnosed later. So are those the kids that have that structure and routine that just can just have to have that routine just a certain way? That you know, I, that I would, yes, absolutely so. stress. And that is something that kids that. that are dealing with this just need to have. You've got to be consistent. And your lives are crazy and you're running this way and that way for sports and and, and I understand yes. that, but this has got to be a primary focus. When it is school time is over, it is time to sit down and do homework. It's not, it's not going to this and going to that and this and that. You've got to find that routine and stick with it because that is probably the hardest thing. And that is just a society problem right now that it, it, everything is crazy and there's so many things and activities and football practices and you know everything that disrupt that routine and that makes that makes their life <laughs> that much more difficult what are your thoughts with um, cell phones and computers like before bedtime I mean do you say okay no technology for a certain period of time to help them sleep easier uh, or if they have a problem sleeping I definitely yes, and, yes. and in most cases these kids do have some degree of problem sleeping um, hard time getting them into bed hard time winding down, yes. hard time, you know, it's usually 11 o'clock before they're even thinking about wanting to be ready and they've got every excuse in the book and so trying, and that's the other thing is a consistent bedtime routine. You need to have a, <laughs> again, stick with the time, stick with the routine, you know, you do, you brush your teeth, you do your, you know, whatever, uh, some kind of a calm down thing so that, and you just stick with it. But. Yeah, I would try to limit no watching TV in bed, um, you know. Good, like sleep hygiene. Just sleep hygiene for that. You know, no caffeine, that type of thing. No cell phones by your ears. <laughs> yes. Usually it's this. Yeah. Yes. yes, it's the texting. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It's a new age. It's, it's with new problems. Yeah. yeah that's for sure. Yeah. Let's keep it more. I guess the other thing to your question is if you see somebody who's in their teens maybe and this, this is coming out, and I know you, like you said comorbidities, and maybe I'm just jaded, but you, there's other things, substance use disorders. Yeah, that's a good well. point too. And I, I don't mean to be something negative, but then, you know, if some people are, you know, the grades are just crashing and they're burning and they're you know, not doing the things that they need to be doing, you know, that's, that's another component. Mm -hmm. you know, Very well. good point. Because they might have depression or anxiety and try to uh, self medicate. Right. And otherwise, too. You know, other problems. So, any other questions? Or 
Very good. Thank you very much, sir. That's great. Thank you.